stickball, softball toss, pick up games of hoops and touch football. That's what happened on the schoolyard when I was a kid. And those of us who could throw, catch, shoot, and run, we ruled the asphalt. We chose up the sides, we set the end zones, and out of bounds, we carried the ball, set the screens, and threw up the shots. We'll take Falvey, you take LaRocca, that's even. You guys kick off, we'll receive. Huddle up, huddle up, Eddie. You do a down and out. Billy, just go long. Mikey, bread and butter. Falvey, stay in the block and make sure you take care of LaRocca. Don't let him in. Give me some time. On three, down. Said, hut, hut, hut. That's just the way it went. We were the untouchables most of the time. Every so often, though, the tide turned rather drastically. And those of us who ruled the roost got a taste of someone else's medicine. I hung with McCarthy, Dugan, Zappia, Cesari, and Pesci, the sons of good old Italian and Irish families. We were all Catholic school boys and St. Monica Grammar School in the Richmond district was our kingdom. When we weren't in the classroom or gym, we were on the schoolyard. You see, stickball was played with a sawed off broomstick and a tennis ball. And on Saturdays, in between basketball games and runs to Bill's place, 25 cent bags of fries and bottles of RC Cola from the corner store. We picked sides and swung the stick. In stickball, a pitch was a lob, a toss that bounced first before crossing home plate. Just a nice pitch to swing at, slow and steady and yellow. No fastball, no curve, no changeup, and no fat barrel of a baseball bat to make contact. Instead, just a thin wooden broomstick handle, which, as you might imagine, made the game that much more interesting. Come on, Eddie, give me a good one on the outside of the plate. That's a good one. What do you want? Take your cut so we don't have all day. Come on, pitcher, 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 belly itcher. There were lots of swings and misses in the game. If the eye-hand dance lagged in any way, forget about it. You just took your cuts and sat down. And at one time or another, we all took our cuts and sat down. But when solid contact was made, huh? Nothing felt sweeter. McCarthy stretches, winds up, and throws. Pesci swings, swung on, hit deep to left center field. The ball sailed, a small yellow dot against a mostly gray sky, lifting higher and higher, deeper and deeper toward the back of the church and over the garage and Father Butler's shiny black Cadillac, farther and farther carrying the fence, bouncing onto the street, and finally rolling to a resting place against the terrazzo steps in front of the McCabe's home. Catholic school boys, what more can I say? We dressed in black cassocks and white surplices, and served daily masses in the early mornings before school. We rang handbells at the Sanctus and carried chalices of gold and lit aromatic resin of frankincense and myrrh. We gave up candy during Lent and got our throats blessed on the Feast of St. Blaise every year on the 3rd of February. We conjured up wrongdoings 
and whispered them to men hidden behind plastic screens in the dark of the confessional box, men whose voices we recognized, but whose faces we could not see. We were small potatoes, really. Small dogs with big barks. Yes, Father, I'll make sure to ring the bells longer. No, Father, I, I wasn't the one throwing the tennis ball against the rectory wall. Yes, Father, I can serve the funeral on Saturday morning. And yes, I'll be sure to wear black shoes. Uh, no, Father, I don't use the Lord's name in vain. One time, a band of public school boys from the local junior high up the street strolled into the schoolyard. They were a group of black and brown boys, African-American and Filipino. They smoked, they fought, they hustled, and they carried blades. And they knew exactly where to get their chump change. Their tactics were simple and smart. One on the playground, they divided and conquered. The tall one went to McCarthy at home, the short one to Zappia on the mound, the skinny one to Cesari at third, the dark one to Pesci at second, the heavy one to me, Estrada, at first. On and on they went until every last one of us was covered. No one was spared. Give me some money, blood. You know you got some? I don't have anything. I left my money at home. Don't lie to me, blood. I kick your ass. I know you got some. My classmates' dimes and quarters and 50-cent pieces were handed over just like that. Their pockets turned inside out, emptied willingly, given up without a fight, without a word of protest. They rolled over and played dead. That's what they did. And I would have done the same if it weren't for a simple twist of fate. Just as the heavy one was ready to shake me down, the short one on the mound with Zapia nodded over to my guy and shook him off. Leave him alone, he said. I recognized the voice first, and then the brown face hidden in the shadows of the black knit cap that stretched down to his eyes. It was Butchie, my cousin. Well, sort of. You see, if you were Filipino, like Butchie and I were, and if your mothers knew one another before they came to America, if they showed up at the same parties and fiestas and picked food from the same tables, if they danced on the same hardwood floors at 106 South Park, if they attended the same high mass at the same time at the same church, if they went to the same weddings and christenings and funerals, then you were cousins, period. But you was my cousin, and he knew that blood was thicker than water. Leave him alone, he said. And that's exactly what the heavy one did. He left me alone. My coins remained with me with all, while all my friends coughed up theirs. They were stripped down and left standing with pockets turned inside out, hanging from their Levi's like velveteen rabbit ears. And for us, the shakedown was a lesson in humility. Although we ruled within the perimeter of our small world, cordoned off by cyclone fences and church glass windows with a shiny black Cadillac and rectory, the outside world still pressed down upon us and seeped through the doorways and iron gates to knock us around and to put us in our place, a tenderizing of sorts, so as to ready us for life's lessons we needed to learn. 
no one stays on top forever. Leave him alone. Simple words yet steeped in some deeper truth that I wasn't learning on the playground with my white friends. I was one of the few brown boys amidst a sea of white. And at the time, it was easy for me to not see that. On the day the hustlers came to town, sure, I was one of the Catholic school boys on the playground who was easy money. But I was also a dark shade of brown. I was Filipino, just like Butchie and the tall one and the skinny one who had come to wreak havoc to turn our parochial world upside down. For me, things went even deeper. Encoded between the letters and spacings of Butchie's three words was yet another truth, one more salient and critical to my own survival than any of the others, and one that would continue to knock at my door over and over and over again. On the day my cousin and the hustlers came to town, Brown saved me. End of story. Yes, Butchie, blood is indeed thicker than water. All right, who made the last out? McCarthy did? Who's up then? Cesari, let's play ball. Pitch it, Eddie. Thank you.